Hi, my name is Dr. Frank Spidell, and welcome to The Doctor Is In. In this program, we will explore healthcare in the U.S. and how we both as individuals and society experience and interact with healthcare. I want to consider the frustration and successes that abound in U.S. healthcare, perhaps to reflect on the barriers and opportunities that litter the landscape of U.S. healthcare today. It's helpful to know where we have been to see better where we are going. I was fortunate in my medical education to be taught by a wonderful human being and neurologist, Dr. Haidar Gupta. Uh, Dr. Gupta shared with his residents that we are hardwired to care. It's in our genetics that even the most primitive, difficult, backward, challenged societies, when somebody becomes ill, those around them will try to make them better. We're also fortunately hardwired as a species to observe, to record our observations, to consider our observations, and to share this with those around us. Now, this disposition towards observing and making conclusions uh, is the story of healthcare. Uh, millennia long ago, uh, we started out viewing things that happened that were bad to people as, as events that were caused by the gods or by some uh, demonic source of uh, entertainment for some creatures. Uh, over time, we looked at this and we evolved. We recorded our observations and made considerations and we progressed to the stage where we saw illness not as a game played by superior beings, we saw illnesses as something that could be understood, that we could apply rational thought to, that we could analyze and create solutions for. Uh, early in this process, uh, the Greeks sort of pioneered the way. Uh, there was a uh, picture that you'll see of uh, a stone carving of uh, one of the fathers of Greek me medicine. Asclepius. And if you look at this picture, you'll see Asclepius is in the center. And as you view the picture to his right, there are two men. Those are his sons, his sons Machion, who is attributed to be the patron of surgeon, and the other is Podolysius, uh, who is considered to be the father of medicine, where treating is done not with a knife, but with ointments and herbs and remedies. Also, I want you to look Further to the right are two women there. Those two women are his daughters. His daughters, Hygieia, who was the patroness of health, and Panacea, who was the patroness of remedies. Time marches on. Uh, Hippocrates arrives on the scene in the 5th century BC. What does this old Greek have that he can, that he can add to us in the... Uh, 21st century. A lot. What do we know about Hippocrates? The thing that comes to mind is the Hippocratic Oath. From the very start of our recorded, recorded explorations of how to provide care for our patients is admonitions about what the behavior of the care provider should be. From the very beginning of recorded medicine, our standards of behavior are written down, are codified. And it's kind of fun, too. I, I invite you sometime, look at the initiation, the start of the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, Hippocrates starts the oath by saying, I swear by Apollo the physician, by Asclepius, by Hygieia, by panacea, 2,500 years ago, at the start of our documentation of what's expected in healthcare, women are there. Women are there and identified by name. So from this wonderful uh, ancient old Greek, besides that admonition as to how we should behave, there's another thing that comes along. He starts to quantify and to describe and to capture uh, in his school, thoughts about things such as anatomy, physiology, pathology, 
the need for a diagnosis. And from a diagnosis, can we make a prognosis? And from the prognosis and diagnosis must follow some therapy to get us to where we want to be. Now, one of the things that comes down through the ages of the therapy that I talked about is, uh, I tried to avoid ever using it, but there's a technique for reducing the dislocated shoulder. It's even, you even see pictures of today. It's called a Hippo Hippocratic reduction, where you kick your shoe off and you, you put your foot into the armpit of the patient with a dislocated shoulder and you use your foot as a lever as you pull traction to put the bone back in its socket, to put the humerus back in the glenoid fossa. Uh, so the other thing we have the her teach from the Greeks at this time too is is we have now progressed from sup, sup, attribution to supernatural forces controlling us to a value system where it starts with observing, putting the patient first, dealing with honesty to the patient, and trying to assist nature in going in the right direction. Uh, this comes to its fruition and to its magnificence in the 19th century. We've made lots of progress, but in the 19th century, uh, the revolution was not on the streets of Paris digging up cobblestones and singing songs. The revolution comes with science, with noting things that were making surgery bad, such as the pain, the inability to control our patient's pain. The other thing is the uh, wounds would get infected. Infections was what destroyed us post-surgery and post-injury. Beginning with Presley, uh, anesthesia comes in. Uh, there's a guy named Presley who notices something called nitrous oxide, called laughing gas. Well, that evolves into parties where everybody gets euphoric. And somebody notes that when people are partying, they're kind of euphoric, but they're also indifferent to pain. This evolves then into the use of nitrous oxide, ether, and chloroform for surgeries, starting with dentists, and there was a, a, a one surgeon, uh, Dr. Crawford Long, who did three cases in 1842 with ether, and then going on to a Dr. John C. Warren. So this is this is a, a addressing in the 19th century pain and surgery. Also, the the challenge of uh, we do the surgery, the patient feels no pain, and we have a lethal infection. Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1843 made the observation that somehow the infection that comes with childbirth, pupil fever, probably is transmitted person to person. Uh, Semmelweis uh, comes to the conclusion in 1851 that something can be done about this. He decides to require hand washing and by simply washing hands, changing your clothes between cases. Semmelweis documents dropping mortality from 18% to one-tenth to two-tenths of one percent. <clears throat> Along with Semmelweis's observation about the, the wonderfulness of hand washing and changing your clothes, uh, Lister notes that if somebody fractures their ankle and the bone breaks the skin, that's a disaster. That will get infection. That will become infected and cause problems. So he starts considering how to, how to eliminate infections by using carbolic acid to prep the skin for surgery. Now there's a wonderful picture that, we, that uh, especially in Philadelphia, the Gross Clinic, that we see. And we note Samuel Gross, the great and famous surgeon. If you look at that picture, what do you see? Oh, they're not wearing gloves. They're wearing street gloves. Uh, Gross, for all his greatness, was not a fan of uh, Semmelweis, Lister, and the antiseptic movement. Uh, so following up on this and joining me today is Carol Adrian, producer, writer of Civil War Medicine, the documentary series. Carol, welcome to The Doctor Is In. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Frank. You're... You, when I was reading about what you're doing, I was reading, uh, there's a trailer for the movie that you're producing. Uh, I was fascinated. There are some incredibly great people in there. Tell me about someone named Anne Preston. Anne Preston was very unusual. She came to the field of medicine much earlier than most women were permitted or allowed 
to do. And she actually grew up not far from here in Chester County to a Quaker family. And it really was a society of friends who sponsored a lot of women going into the field of medicine. So Anne became, in 1850, one of the first students of the Female Medical College, which was in the 200 block of Arch Street in Philadelphia. Eight students began. Uh, it was started by two men, and uh, eight students registered. Five of them were from the Society of Friends. They were Quakers. And within three years, Anne had become a professor at the school. And in uh, six years, she became the director. And under her administration, the first African American and the first Native American women were studying for their MDs. And that, when was that happened that, that she embraced the African American and Native population? This was in uh, closer to 1870. She became director in 1866. When did it move from Arch Street? Didn't it move out to? Uh... It did. Um, I'm not sure exactly. It had a couple of moves, and then it wound up in the Roxborough area where it was for many years. And actually, the archives from there went to Hahnemann and then to the Drexel Legacy Center in East Falls, which is a wonderful, wonderful research facility. I must confess right now, uh, Carol, I, I did my residency in emergency medicine at uh, the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Uh, I was heartbroken that the name used to be the Women's Medical College. I think they tried to make it more generic, and I think they gave away a lot of wonderful history. If we can't take pride in our history, don't we have a problem at times? We do, but I think we kind of have to honor the evolution as well and the coexistence of the genders within the field, so <laughs> it does lead to that. I understand that. Clara Barton. Clara Barton. Most people know her as a nurse, but she thought of herself as a relief worker. She did remarkably um, organized activities during the war. She was an organizer, a coordinator, very forthright and assertive for a woman at that time. And after the war, she established an office which answered 60,000 requests about missing soldiers. I have a little ghost story, Clara Barton Wise. About 12 or 13 years ago, in Washington, D.C., a government contractor was going through some buildings. We weren't sure where this office had been. And he, so he was evaluating the buildings as to whether they should be rehabbed or torn down. And he was standing in one looking out the window, and he said he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he turned around, and since this is a ghost story, of course, no one was there. <laughs> so he looked out again, felt another tap. He whirled around, and as he turned, he saw a little piece of paper sticking out between the wall and the ceiling. So he went up into the attic and there was the sign, the Office of Missing Soldiers, which is now in the collection of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. So Clara really set a precedent for women in an administrative position during the Civil War, a very new and unusual role for them. And certainly the ghost story is consistent with observing, recording, and then sharing. I noticed in your introduction, I thought, wow, this really, it was a nice capsule for what that period encompasses. Yes. Uh, I think you're going to share later on about some other times when this kind of whole process of observing, recording, and the effects that has on improving care. Uh, you mentioned this is a that was a good accidental segue. You mentioned that uh, the genesis of modern healthcare was in the 19th century in the American Civil War. Yes. Tell me about that. Prior to the Civil War, medicine was regarded as an art, not a science. So the Civil War becomes really the axis on which the entire field turns and becomes a scientific field, and it really was as a as a result of having a huge, unprecedented number of casualties. I was happy about this interview because your background in emergency surgery really could not be closer to what these doctors dealt with in the 19th century. It was all emergency medicine, pretty much. Um, 
So it, they begin to document, they begin to keep records, and we'll talk a little bit later about how these records were disseminated, but it's a very dramatic change in medicine and, and the field it's associated with. I, uh, I, I think that, to me, is a turning point. The, the, our ability as a species to see what's around us, to document it, and then to publish it, to share it with others, that leads to a great deal of, of progress. Uh, anything in the, in the granular, at the patient level, changes that you noticed in the Civil War uh, compared to before. What about uh, anesthesia and uh, antisepsis? Well, anesthesia, as you as you touched on, anesthesia actually was something that the dentists had mm -hmm. in the 1840s. In 1847, the College of Physicians of Philadelphia slash Mutter Museum here in Philadelphia um, was featured a report from the dentists on the use of anesthesia to alleviate pain. Now, apparently, President Lincoln was aware of the properties of chloroform and ether because he brought his own chloroform to a dental appointment. Uh, but they begin to use anesthesia, and they begin to use it uh, not only to make patients insensible during operating, but also to relieve pain. I think one of to me, one of the most moving stories, there was a dentist from Massachusetts, William Thomas Green Morton, who was an expert in the administration of ether. And after the battles, frequently, thousands of men wounded lay on the field for up to three days. And he made it his business to go around after the battles and administer ether to give them a small period of relief. And we're hardwired to care for those people around us. Uh, and a little digression here, there's, uh, in the United States Navy, they send uh, warships out. It's usually built around a uh, carrier, and the carrier is the medical asset. Uh, I was a senior medical officer on board a carrier, and I had a 42-bed hospital with a 3-bed ICU and two ORs. And uh, I had a staff, and the, well, I had an anesthesiologist. Uh, but if you're going to run two ORs, you kind of need two anesthesiologists, or at least an anesthetist, or some, some variant on that. You know the Navy, in their wisdom, chose a dentist. The oral surgeon on board, because we had lots of sailors who had dental problems too, the oral surgeon on board was trained and skilled up by the Navy to act as the other anesthesiologist. How much things remain the same even when they change? So the great history of uh, analgesia and anesthesia coming from the dental community persists. It really does. And it advances somewhat in the Civil War because the way you probably know that it was administered in the mid-19th century was soaking a cloth mm -hmm. with ether or chloroform and placing it over the mouth. This gave the surgeons about a nine-minute window of insensibility of the patient in which to operate. Wow. Yeah, and uh, it, a, a Southern, a Confederate uh, doctor Julian Chisholm invented a, something that made the administration of ether and specific um, much more targeted. It was called the Chisholm inhaler, and mm -hmm. that was used for quite a while, in, um, after the war even. But it changed how surgery was accomplished. I, I wanted to mention there, there are an awful lot of stories about the Civil War that that soldiers were thrashing and awake during uh, surgery and amputations. And this actually is, is a tremendous fallacy because, oddly, one of the only drugs that both sides had throughout the war or were ether and chloroform. Almost every surgery was performed that way. But the phenomena which allows that that twitching and spasming of the body. It was something called second stage anesthesia, where before the muscles totally relax, they convulse, although the patient really is unconscious. So that's where we believe a lot of those stories came from, but they were pretty much knocked out. <clears throat> I think we all, those folks that uh, are watching, and you and I, have also experienced something similar to that. What's that? It's a myoclonic jerk. 
when you fall asleep. <gasps> Have you ever twitched like that? Yes. What that's what it's called, myoclonic jerk. Myoclonic jerk. And why does that happen? Okay. The miracle is not that we move. The miracle is that we don't move all the time. The very highest level of our brain doesn't tell the arm to move, it tells it not to move. That's why we have convulsions when we lose the inhibition of our motor cortexes. Oh. So when you fall asleep and things shut down, as you're going into sleep, you'll do your twitch, you'll do your myoclonic jerk. Fascinating, and that is why th that is why they were seen as they put the patients to sleep. There again, that twitch. And nowadays, we've progressed. We do a thing called a neuromuscular blockade, where we paralyze the patient too, which which has its own problems. Uh, there's we, you can always get into trouble when you do interventions, and there are some problems that are associated with that too. But uh, things are progressing there. Uh, I'm fascinated. You said something uh, when we were talking about this show beforehand. What kind of injuries were given palliative care? What kind of injuries were kept pain-free as much as possible? Which ones did they not want to touch during the Civil War? The Civil War really is the beginnings of triage. Uh, it's not formally called that until after World War I, I believe. But the Civil War, if you were shot in the head or in the abdomen or chest, you pretty much were left to die. The goal of the doctors then was to save as many people as possible, and the ones who were easiest to save were those wounded in a limb. And the fastest way to save them was to amputate the wounded limb. There was no resection, there was no, uh, none of the modern tools and techniques that we have were available to them. So the fastest way to save a life you were shot in the elbow, was to amputate. And amazingly, 75% of the amputees did survive, although almost every single surgery was followed by infection. But, you know, I wondered, since you're a doctor in the modern age, and I thought, if you, if you had the lack of tools that they had, the, the really primitive situation, would, would you have found that to be the best solution to save a life? It was amputation. Mm -hmm. I suspect that the other reason for amputation was probably that there was a vascular injury. And one of the great... Uh, I'm out of my depth here. One of the great improvements... You know, wars are horrible. Oh. But that's sometimes when we make progress. The and I medicine. believe that one of the things that progressed during the Korean War was vascular surgery. So it wasn't just the infection. Uh, if you had a compromised circulatory system for the injured, oh. you're at risk. Uh, you're at risk for increased infection with diminished circulation. Uh, I think that that was uh, along with the infection that would be the circulatory uh, challenge. Of, uh, and, you know, a blood vessel does not even have to be transected to be compromised. Uh, Nowadays, we have a problem with high-velocity rounds that ha deliver energy to the soft tissue. That'll, that energy alone can compromise the circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always a challenge when you're debriding a wound is to see what's viable and what's not viable. So that's something that's come up in the 20th and 21st century. Oh. One thing I found very interesting, there were a tremendous number of burns yes. during the Civil War. And the way they treated burns was with lead paint. They would cover the burned area with like house paint, which was lead-based at the time. Um, and it actually, it worked in a lot of ways. It sealed the wound from further infection. It kept it moist. And if it didn't poison them with the lead, <laughs> it could lead to healing. Uh, and again, that comes back to I am sure they just didn't decide, let's do this. Somebody did it. They noted it. Yes. They recorded it, and they shared it with others, and all of a sudden we're using, we're using lead paint on the burns. Uh, fortunately, we've evolved. 
Yes, we have. <laughs> In so, so, so many ways we have evolved. And it's a sin that some of the evolution has to occur with violent conflicts. Uh, what, was the, what was the other name for the Civil War you were sharing with me? I never heard it before. The War of the Rebellion, which is clearly a northern term for the war. So um, it, it's, it's rather a, a negative uh, connotation on, on the southern participation in the war. But yes, the War of the Rebellion was the common usage term. I don't know when actually Civil War, I, I need my Google button, <laughs> came into term, the, the term Civil War. Oh, that's, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know either. Uh, well, certainly it was by 1863. Why do I say that? Why? Then doesn't Lincoln use the term a great civil war in the Gettysburg Address? Oh, yes, he did. Did he? Right. I'm not sure. I, I could, believe he did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I suspect it was there for a while. That's one of the fascinating things is to see uh, how much how we label things tells us what we need to think about them. Uh, a fun song is called The Battle Cry of Freedom that was sung by the Union troops. It tells you why they were leaving their farms in Ohio and their stores in uh, uh, Maine to go down and take chances with their lives. And it was a huge chance, and we tend to forget, but soldiers are almost always very young. And the soldiers in the Civil War were frequently 16, 17, 18, and sometimes as young as 11 or 12. Yes, yes. It was a young man's war. Yes, as so many wars are. Sounds like a Peter, Paul, and Mary song in a way. It does. <laughs> they were blowing in the wind. But, oh, no, that's Dylan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for coming here and joining us today, Carol. You've, you've certainly educated me a great deal about medicine in the Civil War and the Civil War in general. Thank thanks, you. thanks for being oh, here. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> And thank you out there who have taken the time to share this exploration of different parts of healthcare in the United States. Frank Spidell for The Doctor's End.